Okay. We're going to get started in a minute, so I invite everyone to have a seat. Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Dr. Greta Stokes Tucker, and I am your MC for the evening. Now, my first task is to kindly ask you to turn off your cell phones or to mute them. Thank you. Want to welcome you this evening to this important event, the book launch of Subversive Habits, Black Catholic Nuns in the Long African American Freedom Struggle by Dr. Shannon D. Williams. Now for many of us, myself included, we have waited in anticipation for the publication of this book. Let me give you a brief overview of the significance of this event. In August 1968, more than 150 black Catholic sisters from 79 national and international religious congregations came together here in Pittsburgh for a historic and unprecedented gathering forming the foundation of the National Black Sisters Conference. The story of this conference and the circumstances leading to its foundation are part of a century-long history of pioneering black Catholic nuns in the United States and the racism that they endured to pursue their vocations and to desegregate white religious communities. The fidelity and pain of black Catholic women desiring to enter religious communities began long before the National Black Sisters Conference and continues to the present. 
In subversive habits, black Catholic nuns in the long African-American freedom struggle by Dr. Shannon D. Williams provides the first full history of black Catholic nuns in the United States, hailing them as the forgotten prophets of Catholicism and democracy. Dr. Williams' research is unparalleled in its depth, scope, and importance, particularly as our society and church struggle to exercise the demons of white supremacy and systemic race-based injustice. We have for you tonight an informative and insightful evening planned. First, though, we want to thank all of you for participating in this book launch. There are about 140 guests here tonight at the Duquesne University Power Center and more than 500 joining us virtually from all over the United States. I think the numbers speak to the importance of Dr. Williams' research and the publication of her book. We thank Duquesne University as co-sponsor with the Sisters of St. Joseph. In addition, we thank the supporting organizations who through their generosity have made this event possible. Please refer to the back of uh, page of the program for the names of these organizations and thank them as well. We want to particularly acknowledge the Diocese of Pittsburgh and its extraordinary support both for our event this evening and for the foundation of the National Black Sisters Conference in 1968. So now, let us pray. open your hearts and open your minds and allow God's presence to enter in and to bless us as we sing. Now I'm going to sing first, but guess what? You get to sing right along with me this, right after I sing, okay? And I'm going to be watching to make sure everybody's safe.
Amen. 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 Thank you, Carol. Thank you all. Uh, good evening. I am Kathleen Glenister Roberts. I am director of the Honors College and professor of Catholic Studies here at Duquesne. On behalf of Duquesne University, let me echo Dr. Tucker's warm welcome to everyone in attendance here and to all those I see in front of me, but also uh, the hundreds of you who are joining us from afar. We are very grateful to the entire planning committee, to Dr. Tucker and the Catholic Studies Program Manager, Garrett Souter, for their tireless efforts in bringing this evening to fruition. We are immensely honored to host Dr. Williams and the Sisters of St. Joseph. As Dr. Tucker explained to our students in a special lecture earlier this spring, the lives and histories of the Spirit and Fathers, Duquesne University, and Black Catholics in Pittsburgh are deeply intertwined. Part of our mission as a Catholic Studies Department is to enhance the life of the church as a global human family and to celebrate cultural diversity as a precious gift of God's creation. We expect our students to grow and to act according to the spirit and principles of justice and peace. Through responsiveness to the Holy Spirit, we walk with those on the margins and strive to build authentic relationships. We cannot do this without a rich intellectual life that not only understands history, but fosters the wisdom to learn, to listen, to self-critique, and to help heal. The justice of Christ demands no less. And thus, we are humbled to be here with you. As Dr. Williams tweeted recently, the roots of subversive habits are in Pittsburgh, and it is fitting that the book is launched here. On behalf of Duquesne University of the Holy Spirit, we look forward to the conversations tonight that will launch a growth from those intertwined roots into something life-giving and full of Christ's love. Thank you. In our prayer, we just sang, shine down on us with the light of truth. Stir our hearts and set our spirits free. We need to know our faith. We need to know our church. We need to know our history. We need to know the truth. And we need the Holy Spirit to set our hearts and our minds free. And that's why we're gathered here tonight. And we thank Dr. Williams for allowing us to participate in her ongoing work. In planning this event, Dr. Williams' vision was to honor the history and commitment of the three black orders who gave her full access to their archives and researching her book, as well as the National Black Sisters Conference. We are deeply honored by the presence of the sisters who are representing these orders and the conference who will offer brief remarks. So please warmly welcome Sister Rita Michelle Proctor, Oblate Sisters of Providence. <laughs> Sister Sylvia Tibetho, Sisters of the Holy Family. <laughs> Sister Chala Marie Hill, Franciscan Handmaids of the Most Pure Heart of Mary. And Sister Josita Colbert, National Black Sisters Conference. Good evening, everyone. 
Oh, come on. We can do better than that. Good evening, everyone. Oh, there you go. Let's wake up because there are a lot of people out there looking at us on TV. And we want to let them know that we are alive and well. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. And this evening, we have so much to praise God for. And I would like to begin my remarks by thanking God for a woman by the name of Dr. Shannon D. Williams. Amen. A woman who demonstrated determination, commitment, focus, humility, and through God's grace and goodness is telling the story of black Catholic nuns in the long African-American struggle for freedom through the written word. Amen. Amen. Now, for those of you who may not know what the written word is, we can talk later. Thank you, Dr. Williams, for not only fulfilling your dream, but for telling the beautiful, courageous, true, ongoing story of black Catholic nuns. We are deeply grateful to you. It is truly a privilege to be a part of this occasion and to share with you about the Oblate Sisters of Providence, of which I have been a member for 53 years. Now, I'm going to stick to my notes because if I don't, they're going to get me. So, and along with those who bear the name Oblate Sisters, we can truly sing the song, I don't feel no ways tired. I've come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me that the road would be easy, but I don't believe God brought us this far to leave us. Amen? Amen. The Oblate Sisters of Providence is a Catholic religious order of women of predominantly African descent. Our foundress, Elizabeth Clarissa Lang, as she was known then, was born in Santiago, Cuba. And yes, you're going to read about that in that book. She came to the soil of Maryland in the early 1800s. Elizabeth Lang, along with the three other women, Marie Madeline Balas, Rosine Bogg, and Alame Duchemin, wanted to teach the children of color, as black children were called in those days, about God. But before they could teach them about God, they had to teach them how to read. Through their efforts, the first Catholic school for children of color was opened in 1828, named St. Francis School for Colored Girls. In later years, the school became St. Francis Academy. The school started in 1828 by the Oblate Sisters is still going strong today, educating men and women. We just graduated 71 seniors who are off to colleges in different parts of the United States. Amen. St. Francis is the oldest continuously operating black Catholic high school in the United States. Despite the many struggles and obstacles, St. Francis Academy is in its 194th year and continues to be a source of God's providential care and a beacon of hope in these challenging times, especially in Baltimore. And if you know what I'm talking about, say amen. On July 2nd, 1829, with the assistance of Father Nicholas Hector Joubert, a Sulpician priest, the first Catholic religious order of women of African descent was established in Baltimore, Maryland. Elizabeth Clarissa Lang became Mother Mary Lang. Marie Balas became Sister Francis. Rose Bogg became Sister Rose. And Alame Dushman became Sister Teresa. Mother Mary Lang foundress and superior, was no, no stranger to hardships and struggles, having three strikes against her when she came to these shores. She was a woman in a male-dominated society, an immigrant in an English-speaking environment, and black in a slave-holding state. So you know she had a lot of stuff on her plate. Amen. Amen? Amen. Okay, I just, you know, I want to I wanna hear you out there. However, her love for God and her trust in God was evident in her life, and that enabled her and those who joined her to serve God's people, especially, especially the poor and marginalized. 
In speaking about Mother Lyon, we often make reference to her legacy. The word legacy, as you know, means to hand down that which is left by the predecessor. Today, we, the Oblate Sisters of Providence and the Oblate Associates, continue to carry forth the legacy of Mother Mary Lyon in our mission and ministries. While education has always been at the forefront of our ministry, we stretched and grew in other directions throughout our history as the need arose, as, as society dictated it to us. 140 years ago, when Mother Lying and her sisters walked the streets of Baltimore, their compassion and love for those who were overlooked by society compelled them to teach as Jesus did. Long before Malcolm X said, and I quote, education is the passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to the people who prepares for it today, end quote. Mother Lying and her sisters knew the value of education. They had to reach and teach the children about God, who would never, a God who would never abandon them, especially when others disrespected and treated them less than human. If you know what I'm talking about, say amen. amen. Long before the phrase Black Lives Matter, Mother Lang and the Ablay sisters understood that reality. As I reflect over the past and up to the present, I'm reminded, reminded of the words of the Black National Anthem, lift up your voice and sing, and I quote, God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, thou who has brought us thus far on the way, thou who has by thy might led us into the light, keep us, keep us forever in the path we pray. These words hold meaning when I think of our oblate community in the early years as well as now, when the color of their skin became an obstacle to others, when there was little or no food, when there was little or no money to survive, when the hierarchy of the church, of the Catholic church, gave little or no assistance or resources to them, and even told them to disband and go do housework. I am sure I heard a mm-hmm out there, and I'm glad to hear that mm-hmm. I am sure the sisters, when faced with injustice and seemingly insurmountable circumstances, operated within the framework God can make a way out of no way. Amen? As it was then and continues now, the Oblate sisters remain faithful and committed to God, bringing our giftedness to the church and service to God's people. The legacy of trust in a loving, providential God, the faith and courage to serve the needs of God's people, no matter what the cost, has been part of the Ablay Sisters of Providence existence since the first four women made their vows on July 2nd, 1829. Our soon to be 193 years of service, our presence and service has reached many parts in the United States as well as outside of the United States in Cuba, Belize, Costa Rica, and even in Ghana. Amen, Sister Mary Pauline. Amen. She's going to get me when I get back. The many lives touched by the Oblate Sisters of Providence and the relationships that have been built enliven the words of Mother Mary Lyon when she said, my sole wish is to do the will of God. And she didn't say my sole wish is just to do the will of God to take care of this person or that person. My sole wish is to do the will of God. As you know, Mother Lyon is one of the six persons of African descent being considered for sainthood. In 2006, with the support of William Cardinal Keeler, the cause for sainthood was officially opened in Rome. We continue to await the acceptance of the Positio and to pray for a miracle through her intercession. In the meantime, I asked one of our associates, our Oblate associates, why would Mother Lang be considered a saint for our times? I know what the Oblate sisters would say, but I want to hear it from somebody else. So she responded, and I quote, Mother Lang's indomitable faith and spirit, her perseverance and determination in pursuing God's plan, despite the horrific and seemingly insurmountable challenges that she faced due to racism and other injustices, demonstrate uncommon saintly virtues and characteristics. Her ability to, sus to sustain her religious community, educate children, and provide for those who had no place to stay with little or no funds is extraordinary. She withstood attempts to disband her community and maintained it for several years with no ecclesial support. Her ability to survive while facing a prejudiced and unjust society, one that was a real threat to her entire existence and being. 
without retaliation, without anger, Mother, ne Mother Lang did not harbor those thoughts. She demonstrated the demeanor of someone imbued with the virtues of sainthood. Through her perseverance, she showed the church that all of God's people are worthy. All of God's people are worthy, valuable contributors to the building of God's kingdom, end quote. We recognize, we recognize the holiness of Mother Mary Lang, and we pray that soon the Catholic Church will raise her to the highest honors of the altar. This past September, the Archdiocese of Baltimore, after 60 years, opened a brand new state-of-the-art Catholic elementary school named in honor of Mother Mary Lang. <laughs> the enrollment was over 200. They just graduated 28 eighth graders about a week and a half ago that are headed to various high schools in Maryland. We see that as a sign that the efforts of evangelization and academic preparation begun in 1828 by Mother Mary Lyon and the Oblate Sisters of Providence continues where it first started 194 years ago. And to this we say, God be the glory. To God be the glory. Now I'm going to stop here and I'm going to let um, Dr. Williams fill in the blank and you're going to find those blanks in her book. And uh, so I strongly recommend, strongly recommend that not only should you buy the book, but buy one for someone else. Te everyone teach one, each one teach one. You've heard that before. So take her book, read it, and then give it, don't give it to someone else, go buy them a book. <laughs> go buy them a book. So Dr. Williams, again, I thank you from the bottom of my heart, and I'm sure every, uh, every Oblate sister, as well as all the sisters of color, if we want to, want to refer to ourselves as that, is so deeply grateful to you for the work, the work that you have done. Amen, amen, amen. See what energy can do when you're young. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Sister Sylvia Thibodeau. I'm a Holy Family sister from New Orleans. I'm, thank you. I'm deeply grateful to represent my congregation in complimenting Dr. Williams for this extensive work, uh, which is um, truly great. Thank you. Thank you for being here and um, to listen, sit here and listen to my few words. I think that uh, the book, the subtitle of the book is most appropriate because it both identifies and gives truth to what happened. My own religious congregation, the Sisters of the Holy Family, is a metaphor for what this journey of freedom, acceptability, legality is all about. Aniette DeLille, who founded our congregation, was born into a family typical of the complications of enslaved Louisiana. She was two generations removed from slavery and born free, a freedom that came from the descendants of women who cohabitated with wealthy white men. Aniette's mother had children with at least two different white men, and so did the earlier women in her large and complicated family. That is truth. That is history. The fact that Aniette became a religious sister in her day was one of the most unusual occurrences because during the time she lived, only white, young, Catholic, and relatively wealthy women became religious. Aniette was neither. Aniette was born free and Catholic, and her father was probably white. 
so will all the early women who joined our order. Best known are her co-founders, Juliette Gaudin and Josephine Charles, hence their names. The restriction that only women who were born free and from elite families changed after the Civil War, when women who were enslaved became eligible to join religious communities. Most notably is the admission into our community of a woman named Chloe Proval. Chloe had been born a slave and she was um, slave to Arch the Archbishop of New Orleans. This brought a conflict in the small, frail community. Juliet and some members argued that the admission of a freed slave would forever mark the community as subservient and recast it into the role of housekeepers. While Josephine wanted to admit the former slave, so provocative was the disagreement that it split the community between two founding members, Juliet and Josephine. The resolution to this conflict was settled by setting up two houses with two separate superiors, truth. In 1869, Proval entered the split community where Mother Josephine was superior. It was the occasion of Clauval's profession, 1872, that the sisters donned their first habit, 10 years after Mother DeLille's death. Chloe continued to be a housekeeper to the Archbishop. She died in old age, holding an orphan an infant in her arms, faithful to the community throughout her life and considered one of its most valued members. The community flourished in the mid and late 19th century. Although after Henriette's death in 1862, only 12 members remain. It was a difficult time. The war was raging and uncertainty prevailed. In time, they expanded their ministry, both in the city and beyond. This expansion also attracted new members and other, in other parts of the country and the neighboring and neighboring other parts of the state and neighboring countries. The first non-Louisiana member to enter the order was a Miss Suzanne Navarre, who came from New York. She was referenced as the first American to enter the community. The women before her considered themselves French or Spanish. The first transnational woman to enter the order was one Sister Mary Edmund Ogaldez from Dan Griga, Belize, Central America. I interviewed her niece, who is a thriving member of our community at age 95. And she told me the story that had been passed on in the congregation, in her family. Following this, we opened our first mission in Belize in 1898. We ran government schools throughout the country. The largest number of non-United States members to enter the congregation came from Belize. A great number came from Cuba, Jamaica, Barbados, and other island nations. These women assimilated into the congregation. They uh, became United States women. They gave up their own culture. 
their own habits, their own traditions. And to this day, we still have a few, but most of them are aging. In the early 70s, our congregation collaborated with the Archbishop of Benin City, Nigeria, and helping him bring into being an order of indigenous African sisters. And one of them, I probably say, is sitting here with us now, Sister Cecilia Dimacu. She is one of the first members of the congregation, which is thriving. And today, they have continued that our connection with Africa, and the circle continues, they are helping us. So we are so grateful. Our congregation now welcomes African sisters as full members. Um, our first indigenous one, African sister, will make final vows in August this year. Two more will begin initial formation. This is a very hopeful sign for a declining community. The drip drip of those who are coming are beautiful women who understands the reason for their choice. They are smart and they have a deep love for God. They tell us they came because they were inspired by the charism of Venerable Henriette de Lille. Will that be enough to sustain them? We don't know. Our hope is that we have touched the lives of many and made a difference in their lives, that they will carry our mission forward. We are in dialogue about ways to intentionally involve the lay uh, people in our spirituality, charism, and the administration of our temporalities. We have survived splits, storms, yellow fever, COVID, and we battle racism, and still we stand. This year, the year of our Lord, 2022, the Sisters of the Holy Family will celebrate 180 years of believing in God, hoping in God, and loving God. Thank you. Good evening. And today, I'm sorry. I'm Sister Shala Marie Hill, a member of the Franciscan Handmaids of the Most Pure Heart of Mary. As you hear me begin to talk, you'll hear me use the term Handmaids of the Most Pure Heart of Mary because when we were initially founded, we were founded as Handmaids of the Most Pure Heart of Mary and affiliated into, in, um, 1916, and affiliated into the Franciscan order in 1930. Our, um, but today, we thank God for this wonderful opportunity for us to come together to celebrate the book launch of Servasive Habits, Black Catholic Nuns in the Long African American Freedom Struggle by Shannon D. Williams. Congratulations, Dr. Williams. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you. 
We are excited about this book launch. Dr. Williams has shown an extraordinary work in compiling the history, our history, our struggle, as we strive to answer God's call to in the pursuit of religious life. Here is the true truth, as Sister Thea would say. I have been waiting to hold this book, to have this book, to read this book that celebrates the long African-American freedom struggle. As I look at our three congregations of, of black women, black sisters, and I can see the similarities and I can see the differences. Even as Sister Sylvia was speaking about, um, and I'm sure Sister Greta had that same experience. When we were founded, I was um, thinking of the, the sentiments that were, you can put veils on them, but that's not gonna stop them from telling lies and stealing chickens. So that was the thought that was present at the time about black women, and particularly black women who were deemed to think that they could become religious women. Mother Theodore's actions were to do in direct protest to the Jim Crow segregation and white supremacy, to the proposed bill seeking to prohibit white teachers from teaching in colored schools and colored teachers from teaching in white schools. Mother Theodore went into Savannah, Georgia and participated in starting a religious congregation in a state that was racist, had, had, had racist Catholics, as well as rampart anti-Catholic sentiments. Mother Theodore's desire to return to religious life, coupled with her desire to uplift others intellectually, spiritually, and morally. She had courage and perseverance and was certainly a risk taker. What might have made um, her different is that Savannah was not a Catholic city at all. And so some of the, um, even some of the support that one might have gotten where there was many Catholics was definitely non-existence for her. When she, what she sought to do was in protest of the upcoming bill and the ramifications of what this would mean in the education lives of black children. Her actions and those of the sisters in the new community was to show the love of Jesus, the value of caring for others, particularly those who were being affected by racist actions. Today, we are still living with racism and white supremacy. Systemic racism still exists, and the consequences of institutional racism is far-reaching. Today in our schools, our children are still being educationally threatened. Mother Theodore had a discerning heart. She was attentive to the needs of the times. And along with Father um, Listener, who was the co-founder of the Congregation of the Handmaids of Mary, which was founded to fill the ongoing need to have black women religious sisters who would be able to provide education to black children who would be without black teachers to educate them when the proposed bill would come into being. What happened was the proposed bill did not pass. And the sisters were able to teach in Savannah for a little while. Father Listener, who had assisted them, was very supportive, went back to Tenafly and actually some of the support and encouragement that was there for the sisters when he left that left. And Mother Theodore was left in Savannah, and the sisters 
had to turn toward doing laundry and begging food in order to survive. Mother Theodore's constant prayer, Lord, what would you have me do? Was answered by the invitation to come north and staff the nursery which was being prepared to care for the children of those who are fleeing the South in their attempt to come north to have better educational opportunities. So through Catholic charities, they were trying to find a way that they would be able to prepare, um, care for children, particularly infants and young children, while mothers worked. And so the congregation was invited up for that enterprise. And the nursery was actually named St. Benedict and Moore, which was after a black saint. In New York, the sisters also experienced racism and anti-Catholic sentiments. However, they were able to commit and to maintain and minister to all who they came in contact with. Mother Theodore recognized the needs of the times. And in addition to caring for the children through St. Benedict Day Nursery, she also had other ministries. And one that I always think about was in the Great Depression, where the sisters really had no money, but what they would do was actually beg money and then go down to various stores and markets, and they would beg for food. And most of the food, of course, was food that was stale and not able to sell. But they would beg for the food, they would get the food, bring it back, and make soups. And so during the Great Depression, there was always long lines of people at the convent door to get food for the day. And Mother Theodore was there at the head of that line, serving those who came. But this is because of the fact that she did look at what are the needs at this time, and the need at that time was food for people who were hungry. So they found a way to do that. And the people at the door ate the food, and the sisters ate the food. It was food for everyone. And so as our congregation progressed, the ministries that we participated in were always ministries to meet the needs of people. Today, the ministries that we participate in are still those that meet the needs of people. And so we are involved in social justice ministries and looking at how we can um, try to work towards making sure that people are aware that black lives matter, making sure that people are aware that about the dignity and worth of every human being, making sure that people are aware that God loves them and God will care for them. So our ministries over the years change, but our ministries are always ministries that bring the love of God to people in whichever way God would have us to do at that time. And I think it's important that we continue to be open to the inspiration that God gives us as we walk this journey. Today, um, we're 29 sisters. Our newest members are in Nigeria. So we have sisters from Nigeria. Um, and we have a mission house in Nigeria also. And the newer members that we have here, I'm, I'm older but newer to religious life. I've been in religious life 20 years. So our um, sisters who we have here also would like, um, as the previous, um, the previous congregation spoke about, many of our ministries were also from other countries. Because in, particularly I'm thinking about the US Virgin Islands, women were taught by religious and wanted to join religious congregations, but through their priests, who also acted as their spiritual director, it depended on which congregation the priests knew out of the three of us in the United States. And that's where they would tell the women, contact them, they'll accept you, because 
the congregation that taught you will not accept you because you are black. And so we had quite a number of sisters who came to us who traveled to us because of that reason. Um, and, you know, true truth. This is what has happened. And today, as I say, many of our sisters um, are from outside of the country. And that's a, a gift from God because our ministries can continue. We are open to any and anyone who comes to us who is seeking religious life. Our doors are open to them hoping that they will be able to also bring the love of God to others who are wanting to serve God as religious. We continue to pray the prayer that Mother Theodore prayed, which is, Lord, what would you have me to do as we look towards the future and what God has in store for us? And we thank you. I said to Charlotte Marie, I gave them a few minutes to um, breathe before I come up. And as someone had mentioned, and as was mentioned to me by those of you who know Sister Nita Beard and Addie Lorraine Walker, they said, Josita, now you stick to that script because otherwise they'll be here for a while. When I go off, so I'm going to try to be as obedient as my sisters were <laughs> before me in uh, sticking to the script. So here we are. Here we are, this historical day, let me tell you. Celebrating the publication of Dr. Shannon D. Williams' book, Subversive Habits, a book that provides the full history of, of black Catholic nuns in the United States and the uh, many injustices suffered due to systemic racism. Thank you, Shannon, for doing this for us. Yes. The National Black Sisters, of which I'm a member, I should say my name, I'm Sister Josie de Covert, a sister of Notre Dame de Nemur, and I'm also a member, since founding member of the National Black Sisters Conference, and currently its president. Um, and so I bring you greetings. I bring you greetings from the board, as well as our members, some that are here, some founding members, Sister Cora Marie, somewhere here. It's a founding member. There she is. Her hand is up. Of course, our leader is here, um, Patty Gray. The National Black Sisters Conference was established in 1968 to bring together the National Black, to bring together Catholic women, Black Catholic women religious from many congregations from across the United States. And this was done by our leader here, who sits before us. Sister Martin of Porus Gray, RSM, now Sister Dr. Patricia Gray. We wouldn't even be here today if it was not for her. We'd not have the book. She was only 24 years of age when she founded us, not even made final vows, let me tell you, at that time. Thank you, Patty Gray, for bringing us here. And thank you to three historical congregations, because again, we wouldn't be here either if it hadn't been for them showing that, yes, a black woman can serve God in a very special way. And these three congregations have done that. And then our sister, our Patty Gray came along in 68 to verify that, that we can do it. And so she went around the country and, and, and I don't know how she did it, but came up with women, uh, black religious women in the various congregations that sit right here among us, some of them here. Um, and so uh, as I will go on here, as women religious and associates of NBSC, members draw strength and courage from God and support one another and speak on issues that impact 
the African American community. The National Black Sisters Conference focused on providing education resources and spiritual support to black Catholic sisters and black and African American communities that we serve. The organization's mission is, and as was founded, is to study, speak, and act on issues that affect the social, educational, and eco economic and religious milieu of the United States and the world. NBSC promotes a positive self-image among themselves and African peoples in covenant with God and with one another. The members and associates of the sisters and associates of the National Black Sisters Conference are willing to be risk takers in taking a stand and working for the liberation of all black peoples. Among the goals of, of the National Black Sisters Conference is to educate, study, collaborate on issues, <coughs> excuse me, it's my allergies, related to injustices. <coughs> and this was told over and over and over to us um, in the early days by our good leader. And we still manage, we still keep to that vision. <coughs> I just want to share, sorry, among the most noteworthy accomplishments over the 52 some years of the history of the NBSC are the co-founding of the Institute of Black Catholic uh, Studies at Xavier University in Louisiana, the establishment of a Imani Master's Catechist cert cert Certification Program, NBSC work to develop a, a complementary uh, formation program for black Catholic men and women um, and we had what was called then uh, the Sojourner House in Detroit, Michigan, um, which offered, was one of the uh, efforts of such a complementary program. We had the, the Women's Conference that continues to meet every other year as one effort to reach out to black, Catholic, black women of faith across the United States. The design program by our leader here in, in collaboration with Sister Sylvia Thibodeau, who was then in Boston, in collaboration with Harvard University, which allowed black religious women who were not allowed to come to go to any of the colleges, as you know, especially our black Catholic colleges. Um, and so the design program provided an opportunity for the black Catholic religious women to, to receive their bachelor's and master's, if so, so needed. And a number of uh, the women from the three historical black congregations, as well as those women that were in the predominantly European congregations, received their both, and thanks to you again, Patty Gray, um, their both their uh, bachelor's and their master's degree. And Sylvia Thibodeau, too, who was um, principal up there in Hartford at the time, and helped us, and, and did that collaboration with Harvard University. <clears throat> Uh, today, the National Black Sisters Conference is still a national organization of black Catholic religious women and associates who form a strong and cohesive voice in support of the dignity and rights of women of color in creating mentoring and support systems for black women in religious formation, in educating the African-American family, and in confronting still the sin of racism, which continues to permeate our society and the church as we work tirelessly for the liberation of our people. And it's 2020, and, and, and one sister said to me, why did we do this in 1968? And we're still doing it in 2020. Why, why, why is that? The journey has been a long one for the National Black Sisters Conference. However, we continue to stand firm and unbowed. We continue to endure, thank you, <laughs> and to write our story and to pass on our legacy to future generations. We stand at the forefront in the struggle for justice, bearing witness to the struggle, serving the truth of the gospel, of the mission of Christ's church on the earth. And as Dr. Shanna Williams has um, borne testimony to this truth in her book, The History of the Church in America, cannot be written without the inclusion of our story. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Amen. <clears throat>
Thank you, Dr. Shannon B. Williams. I thank you, Dr. Patricia Gray, from the bottom of my heart, our hearts. for setting us, I say free, and letting us know that we are important, that God made us and God has given us gifts and you, you provided the information, Patty, for us to realize that. And Shannon comes along and she lifts that up and does that, did that history um, <laughs> more than I knew about. Um, so these two courageous, these two black women, um, have really set the forefront as well as our historical African-American congregations and letting black women know that God does call us to religious life. It's going to be a struggle. We need to be focused on what it is that God calls us to, regardless of the <coughs> injustices and, and the biasness and, and the systemic racism that we're still facing here in these United States of America, even in our church and in our religious congregations. But I thank you, and I thank those of you who are here today. <coughs> I want to thank in particular the, the leadership of the religious leadership of the women religious congregations and all of those congregations who reached us up out to us, especially after the murder of Dr. Floyd and saying, what is it that we can do together? <coughs> I thank you for being here, Carol. Carol Zinn, Janet Mock, um, and many of you, Sisters of St. Joseph, many of you here, many who are out there um, in the audience who are trying to rectify as, as best you can the sins of our, our church, our leaders, and it's you women religious that will do it. You, you can do it. Uh, we don't need to worry about the bishops and all of those other people. <clears throat> <clears throat> It'll be you, just like our mothers. It'll be you, religious women who will stand up against the sin of racism and speak out and accept and find the best practices in accepting women of color into, your, into the congregations that they see, that God calls them. It's not your congregation. It's, it's how we relate to the particular charism as black women. We too, God calls us too as well as everybody else. So thank you all for, for your support, your presence here, and especially those whose shoulders we stand on, Patty Gray, Patty Gray, I don't know, and Shannon, thank you so much for what you've done and are doing for us. As Sister Proctor would say, amen. amen. Could I invite you please to join me in a moment of silence just to reverence these women and the profound sharing that we've just heard.
Thank you. My name is Sister Sharon Costello, and I'm a member of the leadership team of the Sisters of St. Joseph of Baden. On behalf of the Sisters of St. Joseph of Baden, Pennsylvania, I add my welcome to those that you've already heard, and thank you for joining us in this moment of healing as we recover from our own sin of racism and white privilege. As we humbly work to make amends for our failings, we are honored to sponsor this event, which shines a public light on the painful realities of African-American women who, because of their color, were not welcome to freely respond to God's call to religious life. We are so grateful to Dr. Shannon B. Williams because of her passion, persistence, and voluminous research. Dr. Williams was able to authentically portray the long African-American freedom struggle of black Catholic nuns in her groundbreaking book. She not only revealed a lingering wound of racism in our own congregation, but she also opened a pathway for us to reconcile with Dr. Patricia Gray, Patty, and Shannon, thank you for your courage to speak the truth. We are also grateful to Duquesne University for generous, generously contributing time, talent, and financial support to co-sponsor this event. And finally, let us congratulate and celebrate Dr. Williams on the release of her book, Subversive Habits, Catholic Nuns in the Long American African Freedom Struggle. Dr. Williams is an associate professor of history at the University of Dayton and a historian of the African American experience with research and teaching specializations in women's religious and black freedom movement history. Drawing on oral histories and previously sealed church records, Dr. Williams demonstrates how master narratives of women's religious life and Catholic commitments to racial and gender justice fundamentally change when the lives and experiences of African-American nuns are taken seriously. Please let us warmly welcome Dr. Shannon D. Williams. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. And thank you all for being here today and those of you who are joining us virtually. I am deeply humbled to be in your presence. I'm deeply humbled to be standing here before you 15 years, almost 15 years, August 12th, uh, to the day that I arrived in Pittsburgh in hopes of convincing a woman that everyone told me may not speak to me, <laughs> would speak to me um, about her experiences as Sister M. Martin DePores Gray, RSM, and her leadership in founding the National Black Sisters Conference. For those of you who already have the book, um, you know, um, if you've read the preface, how I came to this project, but I do want to take a moment to uh, lay that history out for those of you who may not be aware. As I have stated previously, I am a cradle Catholic. I was born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee. My mother, who was born and raised in Savannah, Georgia, was educated in black Catholic schools um, for the entirety of her one through 12 education and then in 1974 became one of the first three black women to graduate from the University of Notre Dame. 
interestingly, um, even though I grew up black and Catholic, I had no understanding of the history of black Catholics in the United States. I grew up in a predominantly white southern suburban parish, and it just didn't occur to me. I knew my mother's story. My father was a Protestant. But the only story that I knew was that my mother was a graduate of the National of Notre Dame, and that was kind of it, and we were Catholic, and my mother converted to Catholicism when she was seven years old. My, my grandparents were Protestant, and they remained Protestant, but that was all that I knew. And then I went to graduate school. I went first to the University of Wisconsin at Madison, um, and I got a master's degree in African American Studies and I wrote my master's thesis on Joan Victoria Byrd, who was one of the two women defendants in the New York Panther 21 trial in the late 60s and 70s. And I was drawn to her story because I had wanted to tell my mother's own story, but my mother doesn't talk about Notre Dame. Um, it's not a story she can yet tell. And so I was drawn to the story of this young black Catholic woman who had been drawn into this organization and it was interesting when she was arrested, the news media focused on her because she was Catholic. She was a nursing student. And they focused on her respectability because they could not believe that this young black Catholic girl was a part of this organization that everyone thought was dangerous. And I was struck by that because I was very interested in the Panthers social service ministries. And so I studied her story. Interestingly enough, I probably should have encountered Black Sisters history then because I knew her story. She had graduated from Cathedral High School in New York City, and she had been educated at the All Black Resurrection School. But at the time, because I didn't know black nuns existed, I didn't look to see who ran Resurrection. I didn't know it was a handmade school. I only learned that years after I began studying this and said, oh my goodness, I was supposed to encounter the history then, and I didn't, because I didn't know black nuns existed. It would take another couple of years before I encountered the history and then made the decision to learn more. In my first year at Rutgers, I enrolled in a course in African American history, a seminar in African American history taught by the incomparable Dr. Deborah Gray White. She is a pioneer of black women's history. And so when I enrolled in her course, and she had not yet sort of, she was still sort of taking advisees, and so I wanted to impress her. And so I started out, I went into the archive, I went into the library, and I was gonna find a topic that I could impress this amazing woman. And that is how I encountered the history of black sisters in the United States. I was in Alexander Library, going through microfilmed editions of, to, of black owned newspapers, and I stumbled across an article that changed the rest of my life. More than the article's title, Black Sisters Way Contradictions in Christian and Secular Community, it was this image of four smiling black Catholic nuns that steadied my hand on the reader that day. Again, up until that moment, I had never seen a black nun. And in fact, the only black sister that I knew at the time was Sister Mary Clarence, who was the fictional character played by Whoopi Goldberg in the Sister Act franchise. And I was stunned. I immediately read more, and that evening I called my mother on the telephone. I said, Mom, did you know there were black nuns in our church? And she was like, no. She said, only white nuns taught us in our schools. But then my mother said something to me that she had never said before. She said, I wish we'd had black nuns in Savannah when I was, I wish I had known. I wish we'd had black nuns in Savannah when I was growing up. And one, it was a breakthrough because my mother didn't talk about a lot of that. But then also I said, my goodness, how is it that we as black Catholic women could not know this history that was a part of our church? And so the first thing that I did was a very 21st century thing. I Googled the National Black Sisters Conference. I saw that the organization was still active. And most importantly, I saw that their papers had just been deposited at Marquette University and that they were open to the public. And so I said to myself, okay, this is gonna be my topic. And even though I couldn't get to Marquette in the academic school year, I had from all of the material that I could find on the National Black Sisters Conference, a list of sisters' names and the list of their communities. And I just started writing and calling mother houses and Catholic institutions to see if some of these women were still alive and if I could interview them. 
And that is how the project started. 15 years later, we have subversive habit. And as I think about this opportunity and this moment of celebration, I think about the journey and I think about the intervention in my life. My mother again was educated in Savannah, Georgia and from Father Cyprian Davis's landmark study of the black Catholic community when I encountered it, as soon as I began doing all this research, I found out that two of the nation's eight historically black sisterhoods had been founded in my mother's hometown. And that is when I began to understand that this wasn't a history that was mistakenly left out, right? That it was intentionally left out for me. And as I went through the process of beginning to collect stories, writing mother houses, calling mother houses, going to archives, I went with an open understanding, but also a naivete that probably saved me at the very beginning. I didn't know what I was looking for, so I just went in looking for everything and then found a story that no one was telling and I was wondering why, especially if all of this information was there. And so over the years in doing this work, interviewing sisters, asking questions, reading through tons and tons of archival materials, I began to see a story of the black freedom struggle and really a story of America um, that I knew that people needed to know, wanted, would want to know, but also that may in fact be a very dangerous story. In part because it was clear to me that I could not tell this story accurately and honestly without confronting the church's largely unacknowledged and largely unreconciled histories of colonialism, slavery, and segregation. But I also know that if I was going to undertake this project, I would have to take that risk. And I think, or I hope that I did Black Sisters Stories justice. As much as I want to celebrate the nation's black sisterhoods and those women who desegregated the nation's white congregations over the years, I also want to offer a praise song for those people, institutions, anyone whose livelihoods encountered black sisters over the years who reached out to me over the past 15 years to share their stories. Subversive habits would not have been possible without the tremendous support of so many individuals. People who sent me report cards, sent me photos of their of sisters who had educated them, who told me stories, put me in contact with former sisters. Subversive habits would not have been possible without, without, that, in, without that intervention. And since the book's release, I wanted to share with this audience the enor enormous excitement that has occurred as a result. On Twitter, on email, so many former pupils of the Oblate Sisters of Providence, the Sisters of the Holy Family, and the Franciscan Handmaids of the Most Pure Heart of Mary have reached out. When they saw the book's cover, they didn't necessarily know if it would be a full history, and so individuals would reach out. Are the Oblate Sisters of Providence included? Absolutely. And then one woman on Twitter said, fantastic, my former teacher, the most wonderful person in the world, Sister Emily Burke, was a member of that order. And I said, oh my goodness, I included a photo of Sister Emily and her siblings in the book. I hope you get a copy. Earlier on, I think maybe within a week of the book's release, I received an email from a priest in Minnesota who was telling me about two former oblates, two, a one oblate sister of Providence and another former sister who was a member of his community who has since passed on. And in sending me those women's names, I realized that I had finally been able to found, find a sister who I'd been looking for for 15 years. I didn't find her before I wrote the book. But if you read the book, in chapter three, there is a story of a pioneering black sister in Chicago who in 1962 faced a revolt by white Catholic mothers after she was assigned to teach at their school. She subsequently leaves religious life. 
She remains in the church. She remains uh, a leading Catholic educator, um, goes on to earn her PhD, um, and does amazing work in Minneapolis and St. Paul. And in her obituary, she talks about what happened to her. She was a servite of Mary, and while she had passed on, her sister was still alive, and as was her nephew. And once they found out, they sent me her photo and shared their story. I tell this story because even though we've lost so much, so many people who have been affected by the lives and labors of black sisters are holding on to the legacy. They are hanging on to the materials. They have been waiting for someone to collect the story. Another individual who contacted me on Twitter, thanks so much, this is so cool, I was definitely, I'll definitely check it out, and sent a picture of her Aunt Lucille, who was a holy family sister, also noting that she had great aunts who were also holy family sisters. Former pupils of the Oblate Sisters of Providence, particularly in Charleston, who were graduates of their Immaculate Conception School, have reached out to me over the years, sharing stories, also in wake um, of the publication of the book, you get these amazing stories of people who are hanging on and living proof of the legacies of the nation's black sisters, some who are Catholic, but also those who were not Catholic, but whose parents put them into Catholic schools. This is one example that I wanted to share of a, an, a man who was a graduate of IC in Charleston, South Carolina, stating, quote, so much of who I am today was set in place there as I went from a home of a black woman to a school operated and taught by black women. The process at times was punishing, but I give thanks to my creator every morning for what those nuns sacrificed for us to be taught some of the best education in the world. He also tells another story, by the way. The first person I saw do a crossover dribble was Sister Paul. As every member of either the girls or boys state championship teams in their sixth grade had her as their coach of their team. That although it is a painful story, a story of perseverance and resistance to white supremacy and racism, it is also a story of the great, uh, of, of the faithfulness, the educational expertise, the excellence of black sisters that I hope that I convey in this book. Others in particular, a woman who wanted to who when she got a copy of my book reached out to me and she said, I immediately went to your index to see if Sister Helen Collier was in there and she was there. And I want you to see her signature if you've never seen it before. And she sent me her postcard. What I wanted to do tonight is offer a praise song to the nation's black Catholic sisters because those who I've interviewed over the years have been singing this praise song and it is my greatest hope that Subversive Habits does their stories justice and is indeed a praise song for these courageous women. One final story that I wanted to share, and this was something that was given to me before the book came out. Other graduates of IC, particularly those who were forced to leave IC and integrate into Bishop John England, all talked about that painful experience. But they also say, that no one was ready for us because we walked into, the, into Bishop John England with our backs straight, our heads high, and knew that we were bringing with them into that institution the great legacy of the Oblate Sisters of Providence. They tell amazing stories of the sisters, the home visits, things that you'll never be able to get from the archive, of the sisters coming to people's homes, the sisters in their discipline, although loving, but discipline, the manners, the culture of these communities that has been hidden from us. I also want to tonight honor those women who told me their stories but did not live to see the publication of Subversive Habits. I interviewed over 150 sisters over the years and ex-sisters over the years. Many of them are still with us but I do want to speak the names of Sister Mary Alice Chenoweth, Sister Naomi Smith, Sister Eva Regina Martin, Sister Mary Greta Jupiter, Sister Sandra Smithson, Sister Rosella Holloman, Sister Mary Antona Ebo, Sister Patricia Haley, Sister Rose DeLima Hazor, and Dr. Yvonne Irvin. 
Without these women's and their contributions, the verse of habits would not have been possible. I also want to speak the name of one priest who recently passed away. Oh, it's... Oh, back, go back. Thank you. I also want to speak the name of Father Charles Burns. He recently passed away in California. He was a member of the Society of the Divine Word. And I want to, just for a couple of minutes, show a clip um, from a speech that Father Burns gave in 1990, in the early 1990s, uh, in honor of Black History Month, um, in which he, in many ways, gave me the last piece that made possible subversive habits. It takes 15 years, not only because I needed to do the research, the archival, the periodical, and the oral history research, but also I was waiting for just pieces of the book to come together. And he gave me the final piece that I had been looking for. And I'm gonna show a video and then I'm gonna explain what he's doing in the video and then offer my final remarks. just 
rapidly ate away in her body. And one of the beautiful black priests that ministered to Sister Dolores Howell at that time in Boston, Massachusetts, was Father John Ford, one of a friend of many of you here, a Trinitarian father. And John attests to this, that one day, when the cancer was just so very painful to Dolores, now remember, Thea was still living. Dolores was suffering so greatly from her cancer, but in her pain, John says that she cried out, Thea, 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 help me to suffer. Thea, Thea, teach me to suffer. Thea, Thea. Is it any wonder that many of us believe that she is truly a saint? I wanted to show this clip for several reasons. First, I wanted to speak the name of Sister Thea Bowman, who was the third African-American sister on the road to canonization within our church. I also wanted to draw your attention to this video that I, f I saw for the first time at the 50th anniversary of the National Black Sisters Conference, which was held in New Orleans, because it was the first time that I found any confirmation, any admission, confirming Dr. Gray's experience at the first meeting of the Black Catholic Clergy Caucus ever that the reason why black sisters stories have not been told is not simply because of a commitment to white supremacy within our church, but also because there is a history and a gross history of misogyny. That if you were to read Father Cyprian Davis's landmark and incredible text on the US black Catholic community, Sister M. Martin DeGloris Gray is not included. Her existence, at the founding meeting of the Black Catholic Clergy Caucus is not included. And in part, it's because to include her in that space, you have to say what happened. And Father Burns is the only person outside of Dr. Gray who has ever said that there was an exclusion, that there was a confrontation. He refers to it as a reprimand. He says 1965, it's 1968. But even more so than that, um, it was a desire on the part of this group of men to not have her in the caucus. You'll read about it in the book, and I even just simply describe it as a confrontation. Even Dr. Gray didn't necessarily tell me all of what happened until after the book was in. And it was not even something that came out. It was just in a regular conversation in which she said, a group of men surrounded me when I walked in the room and they screamed at me for 30 minutes to get out. To tell that story is to tell all of the story or the true truth of that experience. It's not in Cyprian Davis's book. Even Father Joe Davis in his recounting of the formation of the National Office for Black Catholics, who himself was also initially excluded from joining the priest caucus because he was a brother and not a priest, never wrote about it, even though he experienced the same exclusion. And I say that I was waiting on this film because I knew something was there, I didn't know, and we encountered it finally in 2018. And I say that it is also the intervention of God because in this particular case, the woman who recorded the film of Father Charles Burns, it was actually recorded on a videotape, Valerie Shields had said to me when she gave me permission to use it, she said, I almost threw it away. I had been holding on to this videotape for so long, and then the 50th anniversary came along, and she said, we were gonna put it in the video. And when I saw it, I said, oh my goodness, there it is. Not that I didn't believe Patty. She wrote about it, she talked about it in the late 60s and the early 70s, but I never found any confirmation. In fact, if you read Father Cyprian Davis's book, the National Black Sisters Conference is relegated to one mention on the timeline at the back of the book. And so not only am I with this book 
telling the stories of black sisters, I want to make sure that I am offering a correction to a wrong. That we know that one of the greatest weapons of white supremacy, but we also know and can say misogyny and misogynoir is the ability to erase the history of its violence and its victims. And so one of the most radical things that we can do when you are confronted with a silence past is to tell the story that was never meant to be told. As I think about the journey to subversive habits, the time, the energy, the patience, the profound fear that I had, the moments when I walked away from the project for a couple of months because I didn't think I was the person to do it, that I didn't want the weight of the stories. I would always come back to the interventions of the Holy Spirit in my life. But oftentimes, I would turn to the words of one of our greatest Catholic writers, Toni Morrison. In her collection of essays, The Source of Self-Regard, she reflects on the reality of humanity and how we are all called to be moral inhabitants of this world, whether we want to or not, despite our feeble attempts, that we must recognize that and take our place in this world. But when we do this, we recognize the pain of the world and the cruelty of the world. But she also wrote that cruelty is a mystery. But if we see the world as one long, brutal game, then we bump into another mystery. The mystery of beauty, of light, the canary that sings on the skull. Unless all ages and all races of man have been deluded, there seems to be such a thing as grace, such a thing as beauty, such a thing as harmony, all wholly free and available to us. In this journey of telling Black sisters' stories, I've encountered a brutal history of white supremacy. But I've also encountered grace. I've also encountered a history of beauty the beauty of the faithfulness of the nation's black Catholic sisters, the beauty and promise of justice, of reconciliation, and of peace. And I want to thank Dr. Patricia Gray for showing me that, for keeping me in the church. I want to thank Sister Mary Pellegrino of the Sisters of St. Joseph for showing me the power and possibility of reconciliation, of justice, of peace. I want to say thank Sister Sally Witt. I gave a talk in London years ago. It was when I was first starting out, and I was writing about the National Black Sisters Conference. And at the time, I was still very scared to tell these stories. My voice would tremble when I gave my talks. And at the times, you know, I wouldn't say everything that I knew already. But on this particular day, um, at this particular conference in London, and telling the story of Sister M. Barton DePores Gray as Pittsburgh's first black religious sister of mercy, I also made that point to say that although she had entered the Religious Sisters of Mercy. She had been previously denied admission to another congregation on the basis of race. Up until that point, I never said the congregation. But for whatever reason, I said the name of that congregation that day. And Sister Sally came to me immediately after my talk and said, that's my congregation. And I would have entered the same year as Dr. Gray had she been admitted. And she immediately said, what can we do to reach out to her? What can we do to try to make amends? And until that moment, I actually didn't understand the purpose of my work. I knew that I was telling black sister stories. I knew that it was important to black history, black women's history, to the history of the church, to the history of the United States. But I hadn't considered the possibility of people being transformed by black sisters truth telling. It wasn't in my awareness yet for whatever reason. I was only this committed graduate student who's going to write a wrong and tell a story that's been suppressed. 
And in the process, my faith was restored in ways in which I never thought it could be. And I want to thank all of these women and invite them to stage, to the stage, to have a different kind of conversation, one filled with hope, grace, beauty, love, and in celebration of the amazing story of the nation's black Catholic sisters. Thank you. So I want to start us out, I think. Thinking about the last 15 years, um, I have been truly honored and blessed to bear witness to an opportunity for communities ready to reckon with the sin history of racism within the church and within their own communities. Um, as I said, in ways in which never occurred to me when I began the project. And I wanted to begin with my own story as I look back on it now, 15 years ago, and to begin to highlight some connections that I think are relevant for us as we talk about the Spirit and the Holy Spirit and the ways in which it has guided this project. I say this in the introduction and also in the preface and in the acknowledgments. I'm not sure if my mother, at seven years old, had not found the courage to ask her Protestant grandparents to convert to Catholicism, and my grandparents saying yes if I would be the person to write the story. As I mentioned, my mother was educated in Savannah, Georgia. Literally, her journey into the Catholic Church was made possible by the efforts and the faithfulness of the Sisters of the uh, St. Francis of the Third Order, which was a community founded by Mother Matilda Beasley, who was Georgia's first black Catholic nun, and then the work of the Franciscan Handmaids of the Most Pure Heart of Mary. My mother literally came out of St. Mary's. That was her first Catholic school, which was previously Most Pure Heart of Mary Church. That is where the sisters went. And so I see myself as a legacy, not only of Mother Theodore, but also uh, of Mother Matilda. And I wanted us to sort of talk about that interaction and what drew me specifically uh, to do this work in that moment, wanting to understand why I, as a descendant of these women, had never known that they had existed and then came into uh, studying this history. But I guess I wanted to first start with Dr. Gray and maybe begin with our first interaction. Again, as I mentioned, in August, in August, uh, on August 12th, it'll be 15 years to the day that I first met her and that I came to the Pittsburgh area to interview her. I had tracked her down. I had sort of found her address and information. I'd written her letters. I had called. And then after um, a three-way conversation with myself, Dr. Gray, and Rosemary Gimperly, is she still here? who was an early secretary of the National Black Sisters Conference and who was a niece of Mother Thomas Aquinas Carroll, uh, put me in contact with Dr. Gray, and Dr. Gray invited me to her home to interview her. And basically, she said she wanted to see me um, to see if she would be comfortable <laughs> sharing her story with me, or at the very least, wanted to speak with me to learn about my interest in the National Black Sisters Conference. What was that? Do you remember that day, that first encounter? What I remember. Oh. Yes, I do remember. And hello to everybody. Um, <laughs> and thank you for being here. But I, that was a day that 
was really marked. And it was um, marked for me because I really was unwilling to really talk about my experiences. I was willing to talk about the National Black Sisters Conference because that was what was important. It's where our nuns, we were, it was so important for us to bring, to come together and to really come to terms with who we were as beautiful black women with the gifts and the powers to make a difference wherever we are. And that was important to me. But to talk about me in that process was something that um, I reluctantly walked through, but said very little. Um, and it didn't matter because it wasn't about me. It really was about the sisters conference. And it was about all the sisters who went ahead of me. And I understood Dr. Shannon D. Williams' persistence to want to hear from me. <laughs> but what I think she did not understand, but really did respect, was my reluctance to share very much. And part of that was because at least I thought that I had come to terms with many of the issues and situations and memories in a way that I didn't need to do anything about them. But, <laughs> but she promised that she would help me in any way possible. Yes. She put me in contact with sisters who had married and I would have never been able to find their name because they changed their names. Yes. She encouraged me to look to the black sisterhoods, to look to the four mothers in the church. She was very adamant that I not write a book simply about the National Black Sisters Conference. She said, if you can, try to tell all of our stories. And I was so young at the time, I was energetic. I was like, I'll do my best. And my best is pretty good. And so I literally went forward. I put my head down. I started contacting people. I was setting up interviews, my advisor, believed in the project from the very beginning. I still remember getting an email from her in like May or June of that year, and she gave me like $2,500 to go and start my research. And that's why I was able to go to the papers of the National Black Sisters Conference. And I was the first person to go through the papers. I also want to speak the name of Dr. Sean Copeland, who was formerly Sister M. Sean Copeland, who was the, the founding executive director of the National Black Sisters Conference. She was one of the earliest sisters that I contacted, and she said to me, you know, we've been waiting on someone to tell this story. I'm glad you're interested. And it was interesting, she was one of the first people, and she probably did more than anyone else to preserve the memory, at least in the scholarly, arena, the scholarly arena. She wrote the first scholarly article in that, on the National Black Sisters Conference. And most importantly, when she was leaving Marquette to join the faculty at Boston College, she left the papers of the National Black Sisters Conference at Marquette and facilitated their deposit at the university's archives. And so at every turn, it all came together. And again, it wasn't until London where I met Sister Sally, where I gave this talk. And afterwards, she came to me smiling, but also very concerned about what she had heard. And I was struck by her gentleness and her sincerity and her desire to make this right. And I wonder, what was your interaction? Because my interaction was just simply, I'll talk to Patty. I'll see if she's interested. What were your thoughts, Sister, Th Sister Sally? <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, it was this, I was surprised, Shannon, tonight when you said you were uh, just started and fearful of this because I had no sense of this. When I heard you, I felt like you knew everything about this. And what struck, st stays with me is the sense of all I did was go to a conference. 
And at that conference, all I did was go into one of the talks. There were simultaneous talks being given. I don't remember why I chose yours. And it says to me, just do the things you're supposed to do because God will make something out of that. Um, that's, I guess that's all I can say about that. It is. I, I think about it as we were talking about it, as we've talked about this over the years of how this all came about. Everyone had to say yes at a particular time, at a particular moment. I had to say yes when I realized, mm, maybe I don't want to do this. It's going to ask a lot, but maybe I should go ahead. Dr. Gray had to say yes. Sister Sally had to say yes. And then Dr. Gray had to say yes again. Because I remember you immediately, I, I said I would reach out to her. I would get her yes. contact information. But I also knew Dr. Gray. And I knew the pain. And I knew the reluctance. And I say this, and I'll say a joke too. Um, you know, for those of you who've seen the story in the Associated Press, I remember when they contacted me and they wanted to do the story, I started contacting the sisters, like, okay, they, they may contact you. And then I, I, but first though, I had to contact Dr. Gray and I had to say, answer the phone if they call. <laughs> Please, I wanna let you know they're gonna do this story. I want you to participate. Think about it, she said she would pray on it. But then I was also kind of like, answer the phone if they call. Please. Um, and I say that because I understand, and this was not simply with, with Dr. Gray. I started this project not anticipating doing oral history interviews. I never thought I would do 150 interviews. I only did about 40 for the dissertation. But it was clear to me that there were just things that you could never get from the oral history, uh, that, from the archival record, um, that you needed to get from the oral histories. They were so rich, um, not only in terms of people's experiences of, in religious life, but in stories of black faithfulness, um, things that don't even get into my book, the stories of black grandmothers and black grandfathers who would put all of their grandchildren in circles at the new year and send a special prayer over them, each of them. Those kinds of stories of black Catholic faithfulness that are still being held by so many uh, black faithful and who are in danger of being lost to us. So I just started doing all these oral histories because I was like, I don't know if this is recorded anywhere. Let me make sure that I get it on, on record. And I knew how difficult it was for people, especially dealing with things that they had not talked about for years. And so I even learned almost immediately when I contact someone, give people a week to sort of think about it. Give them the questions ahead of time. Because what I began to realize is that I would interview a sister or an ex-sister and then after the camera, after the recorder was off, they then began to tell me stories. And I said, oh, well, let me give you some time to think about it um, so that you can process it and also begin to reckon with whatever you may have suppressed in religious life. And so when Sister Sally reached out, she said that she wanted to go back to her community. That she, they wanted to know. And then it was the question of, will Dr. Gray be open to receiving that? And so, Dr. Gray. Well, I will, I just have to talk about the power of the Holy Spirit because none of this would be happening if I didn't block the Spirit. And uh, thank God that didn't happen. But as it turns out, when I was, I was asked by you um, if I would contact the Sisters of St. Joseph, and particularly you, Mary, you really were reaching out to communicate with me, really to search for an opportunity for forgiveness. And I, I, I was struck by this. I had set on that feeling that I felt when I opened that letter after being taught by the Sisters of St. Joseph CCD, all my family went to the Catholic school. We all knew them. And I never thought that I would not be accepted in the congregation. And I was literally stunned when I read it. And I can't tell you, it was like a dagger going through me. I was sick 
deep in the pit of my stomach. And I crumbled it up because I really didn't want to read it again. I didn't want to have that feeling again. And I just sat on that feeling for years and years and years. And when I got that call from you, Dr. Shannon D. Williams, yes, Shannon, she's my, she said that you, Sister Mary, wanted to talk to me, and I couldn't do it. I literally could not do it. And for the first time, I realized that what I was sitting on was not hurt. I was literally angry. And I never, ever allowed myself to experience that anger. Ever, ever, ever. And I really, I told her I had to pray about it. And that I did. I, it took me five months to pray about it. I was, I was disappointed in myself. I was surprised at myself. I didn't really understand that I was angry because I'm not known as a person who gets angry. Everybody will tell you that. I, mean, I shouldn't say everyone, but when I was principal of a school, it's like, you better get some in you. <laughs> because I never got upset about things. So it was at that point that and everything, this is the Holy Spirit, it's like Holy Week redemption, everything's around April. Um, that I called Sister Mary and um, we arranged to meet and she had just come back from Rome. She was at a meeting with the LCWR. LCWR. Yes. And she, this was during the, the Jubilee, the special, uh, excuse me, um, uh, the Pope's Year of Mercy. And she brought back a replica of the Door of Mercy. And um, we were sitting and talking, and um, we reached the point of talking about forgiveness. And there were many tears. Just, we were pretty much speechless. But tears did it all. They spoke for us. And then we I spent, actually, I'm not going to go through it, but probably two to three hours and getting through that. But this is what happened. Um, really, it was a lesson on forgiveness for me. And this is what I had to come to terms with. Because I'm, I was offended. And it's really up to the person who was offended to release the forgiveness to sit. It doesn't matter if the person who offended wants to receive it or not, but it's up to me to be able to forgive. And so this whole journey has been about a lesson of forgiveness, love, forgiveness, and reconciliation. Because once you forgive, love, forgiveness, reconciliation, the power of reconciliation. Jesus did that for us. It enabled us, enables us to come back new and start all over anew, leaving everything else behind. That's the transformation. Jesus did that for us. And I felt like I was I was transformed in that whole process. And from that point on, you let the Holy Spirit do the work. And look what has happened as a result of that. Sister Mary, I didn't know if you wanted to say anything, but my experience of that reconciliation was also profound because up until that point, I had never heard Dr. Gray become emotional. In all of our conversations over the years, it was the first time that I'd ever heard her cry. After everything she had told me, 
And then what was really interesting is that she began to tell me things that she had never told me before about her time in religious life. Things would just come out in conversations, and I was like, you never told me that. Um, that happened? <laughs> really? Um, but it was also transformative for me because it allowed me to finally step all the way back to see how important Black Sisters history was. I was still telling it in sort of a disjointed way. And then I just backed away and I said, this is not the untold story of black sisters in the United States. It's also the story of black sisters in the long freedom struggle. This is a forgotten chapter in the black freedom struggle. I didn't understand it until that moment in that reconciliation. Even at the time, I was like, that's going to be the end of the book. Like, I knew it would be there. Even if the other pieces weren't there yet, I knew that I would have to go find them. And at every turn, that's when I finally began to see the Holy Spirit in it, right? I didn't necessarily see it until that moment. I had moments where I would do conferences and something bad would happen and I would call Patty and she knew I was upset and I couldn't say it and she said, you need to say it. You need to speak it to me. Like that's how you begin the healing process. And so I was holding on to all of this and as, at this moment in which you let it all out, it also helped me to let it all out and back away. And then when we began to have the conversations, I began to see the connections in Black Sisters history that I never saw before. So in the connections when Sister Sally, we were saying, oh, this was the year of mercy. There it is. Look at how this all happened in the same moment, that Sister Mary Pellegrino, and it wasn't just Sister Mary Pellegrino was the leader of the Sisters of St. Joseph of Baden. It was also that she was at the time the incoming president of the Leadership Conference of Women Religious. And so literally when I came that gave that talk at the Leadership Conference of Women Religious, Sister Mary came to me and said, this is, it was, it was like, it was meant to be. And I was like, that also made sense because when Patty came and founded the National Black Sisters Conference and when it was on its way up, Mother Thomas Aquinas Carroll became the pre president of the Leadership Conference of Women Religious. Yes. The National Black Sisters Conference was able to rise and get the, the amplification that it needed because Mother Thomas Aquinas yes. said that she would help it any way and she used all of her resources to help Dr. Gray. And then I began to see all of these other connections that we've recognized over the years. I began to say, well, you know, it's not just simply that my mother was educated in black Catholic schools of Savannah, right? Like, we are the descendants. Like, we are the lineage of Mother Matilda Beasley and Mother Mary Theodore. How was I not seeing that? And then I began to sort of piece together all these interviews that I had done, one with a former president of the National Black Sisters Conference, Sister Donna Banfield. I had interviewed her in Memphis. I was born and raised in Memphis. Sister Thea Bowman is buried in Memphis. I did not know that. That was something that was never taught to me. But I was, oh, she was, she's buried in Mississippi, but she was born, she's, she's born in Mississippi, but she's buried in Memphis in, in Elmwood Cemetery. Her parents are buried there. And she was buried with her parents. And what was really interesting, you know, I said, okay, so I'm going home, I'm doing research. I met with the bishop, who was my bishop, Bishop James Terry Stipe, who was the first African-American bishop of the Diocese of Memphis. And he said, well, I hope you know that there are five black nuns ministering in the Jubilee schools. And I was like, no. He said, well, you should make your way to go interview them. And one of the sisters that I interviewed was Sister Donna Banfield, who told me that she had come out of Atlantic City, New Jersey. And she had come out of a black Catholic parish founded by a black lay woman named Mother Emma Lewis. And I said, oh, and she said, yeah, you know, there are a few black parishes across this country that were founded by black lay women, but because women can't technically, found, like lay people can't found a parish, right? She may not get the credit, but it was founded by her. And I said, that's funny. I was like, you know, Dr. Gray's mother is from Atlantic City. <laughs> and so I went back and I called her. I said, Dr. Gray, you know, there's a parish in Atlantic City called St. Monica's that was founded by this black lay woman. That's my mother's parish. <laughs> My aunts all went to that parish. My grandparents were founding members of that parish who would have known Mother Emma. And then we looked at her grandmother, Grace, whose name is Grace, and we went in her, and I said, oh, she's from Catholic Maryland. And I promise you, if we dig, there are going to be about 15 or 20 black lay women in Maryland, Missouri, Kentucky, Louisiana, that we can trace the lineage of the entire black Catholic community to. I promise we'll be able to find it. And I've been seeing it at every turn. The, link, the links that are there yes. at every turn. Yes. But I think about it specifically in terms of what put me in London and Sister Sally in London. Then it was the Sisters of St. Joseph of Baden. And something that I didn't even realize 
I, didn't, I wasn't even thinking about this when I put the book together. The first quote from chapter one, right, is about what the Sisters of St. Joseph did to the Holy Family Sisters in New Orleans and making them, trying to make them take off their habits. And yet at the end of this, to come full circle, here are the Sisters of St. Joseph trying to make this right. It's profound when we sort of see the linkages. And it's been helpful to me when I sort of think about the challenges and sometimes I want to walk away still. But to see the hand of God at every turn. We've seen it, we've talked about it, but I wanted to make sure that people saw this because I hope the book can show the linkages too. Like when you look at the full story, you can see the power of God and the hand of God at every turn. I thank God in the acknowledgements because at no point did I ever intend to pursue a topic in black Catholic history? I was like, there's no history there. It, I didn't know it. And yet it's become my life's work. But I do thank, and I mean, I, I thank these women for keeping me. Um, and, and, I, and I say this, I believe in God. I never stopped believing in God. But I wasn't sure that I saw God working until I was able to step back. And the reconciliation made it possible. It was the tears, it was the conversation, it was the power and the possibility of the moment. And it really gave me a true understanding of what Sister Thea told us, right? Was what happens when we tell the true truth? What does that do for us? Sister Mary, I wanted to offer you the opportunity just to because it also happens because of you. Like everybody said yes, and so did you. Yeah, um, thank you, Shannon. Um, as I'm listening to this and just reliving that experience with Patty and um, just acknowledging even my own part in that small part of knowing the moments when I could have said no. Um, Sally, when you came home, I don't know if you remember, you emailed me and told me what had happened and sent me the story from the NCR and I remember just sitting at my computer, reading that over and over and over again in disbelief. And, and it's some, in, some, in many ways being ashamed that we had done that. And in that moment, knowing that I had, to, I don't know what I was gonna do, but I had to do something. And so in reaching out to you, Patty, I don't know if I've told you this, but in that long wait, I think when you were healing, um, I was writing you letters over and over again in the event that you wouldn't want to speak with me. And would you at least receive a letter? And so um, I never had to send a letter. <laughs> um, and that just was profound. Um, not only the first meeting where you came um, to the mother house, to our mother house, and we really talked and wept and prayed in the chapel. And um, then when you invited me to your home, uh, several months later, and Patty said to me, oh, Mary, I want you to come for dinner. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> and then she texted me a couple of days later and said, well, um, I invited my pastor, Father Tom Burke, and you know, when, he, when you get here, you'll know why. And I, I know Tom from a long time ago. And so we got there, and Tom had no idea why he was there. <laughs> and I really didn't either. And so we were talking, and you were cooking your salmon, you know. And Tom's like, well, what am I doing here? <laughs> so I was like, does he not know the story? <laughs> so you told him the story over the salmon. And then at the end of dinner, um, you invited us into the, to your living room. And the um, door of mercy, the replica, was on the table. And you asked Father Tom to pray a, a prayer of absolution. And I said to you, Patty, I, I know exactly what I'm representing here and what needs to be absolved. But I have no idea what you feel like you had to be absolved from. And can I say what you said? Yes. And you said, I need to be absolved because for 50 years, I never gave voice to my anger. 
And so um, Tom prayed a prayer of absolution, and um, I think that whole, all of this has just changed the trajectory, I think, of all of our lives. You know. And I'm grateful. I, I don't know if we have, are we going to take questions? We don't wear watches. What time is it? <laughs> oh, you we should probably wrap up, but I don't see the bishop. He's here. He's here. Oh, he's there. Oh, where? Okay, he's there. I don't even see him. Okay, I think. Yeah, well, I did want to. I'm. I'm glad that we had this opportunity just to share that piece. Um, as you know, and as you read the book. At the end, I do end with this reconciliation and the possibilities and what it means to not only recover black sisters' voices, to center black sisters' voices, and also to allow ourselves the opportunities to reckon with, for the sake, reckon with this history for the sake of justice, reconciliation, and peace. And I just wanted everyone to hear that story just because it's something that, although I documented, I wanted you to know more of the details just because I think it has been absolutely essential in bringing subversive habits to fruition. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you for Shannon. Me. Thank you for keeping me. Thank you for allowing me to document this history. And thank you for your wisdom, your faithfulness, and thank you for the journey. Wow. I said it would be informative and insightful. What I didn't also say is it would be spiritual. It would be spiritual. We've heard a lot about the importance of honesty, truth, linkage, and allowing the Holy Spirit to guide us, but if we want justice, if we want forgiveness, if we want reconciliation, we must also have the truth. So thank you all who participated tonight. And as we uh, move to closure, there are a couple of just a few reminders for those who are here in person. Uh, you are invited to mingle and have refreshments next door in the Shepherd's Son Suite with Dr. Williams, who will be signing books. Uh, books are available for purchase. For those of you who are participating virtually, you can purchase books through Amazon, through Duke Press, and also if you go to Dr. Williams' website. I want to give a little commercial for the three sisters, uh, the congregations. I am sure if you go to their website, there is a link for donations. And if we want other women to take their places, then we must raise up those vocations in our families and our homes. And not to leave the Black Sisters Conference out. I'm sure they have a donation link as well. If you need a parking voucher, please check in at the registration table where you entered. And in closing, we are honored by the presence of Bishop Zubik, who will offer a final blessing and we are extremely grateful to the Diocese of Pittsburgh for its generous support of this event. And to all of you virtually and those who are here personally, thank you so much 
for being a part of this rich, historical, prayerful, wonderful evening. God bless you. Well, good evening, everybody. So I suspect you may be asking the question, what's a guy like me doing at an event like this? And I have to say that I'm here, first of all, because uh, Patty invited me to be here today, and the Sisters of St. Joseph invited me to be here today, and I think for several reasons. First of all, I think that Patty uh, knows where my heart is. And it's certainly joined to tearing down the walls of bigotry and racism. I think that Patty invited me to be here today because this is the 54th anniversary of the, of the, the National Black Sisters Conference being established. And the fact that it was established here uh, in the Diocese of Pittsburgh in the first conference took place uh, on the campus of what was Mount Mercy College and is now Carlo University. I think that Patty also invited me to be here because uh, people that we relied on in leadership way back then in the 1960s were supporting uh, Patty and what she was doing. Um, Mother uh, Thomas Aquinas, who was the, the, the Mother Superior of the Mercy Sisters, and uh, John Wright, who was the eighth bishop of the Diocese of Pittsburgh, and both of them worked closely together to give Patty both the encouragement and the financial support to move forward with uh, the, the establishment of the, the conference of national of national conference of black sisters, and so before I give the final blessing, I'd just like to offer a, you know, a, a few thoughts. And you know, while uh, the the world and the church uh, and the diocese are much different today than we were in 1968. The need for racial justice and healing within the church and in society at large remains and remains even more urgent. I was thinking as Shannon was talking, I am uh, I'm a, a product of St. Mary's Seminary and University in Baltimore, Maryland. And if you know your history, you know that St. Mary's was established by the Sulpician Fathers in uh, 1791. It was established in 1791. The first black seminarian did not enter, that was not permitted to enter the seminary until 1961. It took 170 years. And so for anyone to deny, den to deny the fact that racism has to be addressed and has to be addressed in the church, as Shannon does in her book, it's also important for us to take an honest look at history. And so I think that, um, you know, as we take a look at what uh, some of our forefathers did who broke through the walls that were there, we all need to be able to join our hands and our hearts to be able to do that. And we do, in fact, find the encouragement to do that because of the reconciliation that we've just heard over the course of the last half hour you know, the re reconciliation that takes place uh, between Patty and the Sisters of St. Joseph. And that's what this book la launch and uh, this evening is really all about, to make healing possible. But you and I know that before healing can be possible, uh, there must, in fact, be an acknowledgement that racism in any of its forms is a sin. And then we must examine our own consciences, each of us, to see where we are guilty of that sin. And only then can we come to understand more deeply what God asks of us, that we strive to love each other as he loves us without any limits. 
And that can only happen by the power of the Spirit. You all know that the canonization of Sister Thea Bowman is, is being advanced. And Sister Thea, like Patty, pioneered the rights of African Americans in the Catholic Church. Sister Thea refused to accept the racial injustices that she too witnessed and experienced in her own religious congregation. Sister Thea called for a full participation in the life of the church of all people, and especially people of color. Now she is on her journey to sainthood, and I pray for her eventual canonization. Sister Thea's legacy serves as a constant reminder to you and me that we not only can but must work together as one human family and see each other in the image and the likeness of God who has made us in his image and likeness. When all is said and done, subversive habits invites us to encounter a Christ who is yearning for justice, healing, and reconciliation. The Holy Spirit needs to work among us. We need the Holy Spirit to open our eyes, our hands, our minds, our souls, and our hearts to him and each other, to all others. We need to listen to God's call to be agents of change so that what Jesus asked of the apostles at the Last Supper and what he asks of us can in fact become a reality. Love one another as I have loved you. Let us pray. Dear God, in so many ways, words can be cheap. But what makes them rich when they, are, when they are spoken from our hearts? This weekend, as we come together to marvel at the ministry of who you are, the sacred trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, we beg you to infuse our minds, our hearts, our souls, our hands, our lives, with the power of your love so that we may be as determined as you want us to be to tear down walls and to build bridges so that together we may work for the equality of all and for the absolute continuation of your justice. And so, dear God, we ask you now to send your blessing upon us. Bless us. Fire up our souls so that many other people may be attracted to you through us. And may you bless us, dear God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And may dear Mother Mary continue to protect us under the mantle of her love. Amen. Thank you all.